Daphne. This is also about power, my presentation. This is also about power, but uh, it is something like a prequel to what we just heard from El Puto, the transfer of power. There are some books, some movies that are made which uh, describe an event or a sequence of events from the point of view of uh, many people. Each person tells his or her side of the story. And we, the reader, the viewer, we have to put together all of these pieces to get the complete picture. Yesterday when I spoke about society, how it groups people and uh, creates structures to group all these people and then uh, generates power and makes this power available to every one of us, it was one side of the story. Now, if we don't look at the same story from the point of view of the main character in this, we, the individual, it's not complete. We get the fuller picture when we do that. Society creates all these groups, it creates the structures, it generates all this power. We as individuals, we choose to belong, we choose to become part of this group. We... Most of us do not say, oh, I want to be alone, I don't want to be part of this. We become a part of the community of the village or town or city. We exercise our voting rights, we go to school and college and we choose to send our children to these institutions. We work together with, with the hundreds or maybe thousands of other people and uh, we pay our taxes. We use all the technology that uh, society has to offer and uh, we, we belong to groups, maybe to uh, an organized religion or some faith, we identify with some group. So we also belong to the society, we choose to belong. And so it's an interactive road between the society and the individual. The words authority and conformity, they have uh, come to have a slightly negative uh, connotation. These words are much maligned actually. I am going to talk about this society and this conformity now as it has existed and as it still is in society and the role that these do have to play. Society, yesterday we talked about the hierarchy like in this uh, movie uh, the movie clip that we just watched in the gladiator, there are hierarchies. Society creates the structure of hierarchy as it evolves. The political hierarchy it starts with the president or the prime minister, then has the ministers, the legislators, the party workers, <coughs> down to the voters. And the military hierarchy, it starts from maybe the king or the commander-in-chief, then the generals and the captains and then the soldiers. This is there in everything. In the gladiator clip that we just watched yesterday, we saw the result of uh, following this line of command. If, if one of the generals uh, tells the king, no, 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 I, I don't think uh, what you're saying is correct, or if one of the captains tells the general, look, I, I have a better idea, how about this? Or, or one of the foot soldiers, he, he refuses to... Uh, um, obey the captain. There, there's no no place for that at all. It just is not allowed. It, it absolute conformity is essential for victory in a battle. And disobedience of this type in such a situation is not accepted at all. Either the so the person is a court martialed or even you know, killed by his own side. And uh, we find these hierarchies and these you know, lines of command in any institution in an organization, in an educational organization, in a business organization, even in the family, the parents exercise some command over the children. Uh, we'll just watch a short movie clip now. This is a, a humorous exaggeration, but it just shows what happens when there is absolutely no authority and when conformity is not uh, required at all of its members. This is a humorous exaggeration, no doubt. Children can be much better behaved than this. But this just gives an idea of how things can turn out when people are given absolute freedom to do what they want, whichever way they want, when there is absolutely no authority 
that is exercised over the members of the group. We uh, see that uh, society has uh, always demanded or at least encouraged conformity from its members. Every society seeks to preserve itself and uh, security, stability of the society. It depends a good deal on the subordination, the obedience of its members. Subordination, obedience, all these uh, have such a negative connotation today. But to this mood functioning of society, we do see that some amount of it is essential. In the earlier societies, physical force was used. People were forced on punishment of death or exile to follow certain rules. Today we are much freer. We, we think we, we have a lot of freedom. Uh, we all feel that we are a lot freer today. We are freer than we were uh, earlier. We, we can choose any religion we want. We uh, study what we want, live what we want. We can have any, any, any political ideology. We are a lot freer. But still, there are some subtle ways, not as physical, as, as uh, forceful as society used, methods that society used earlier, but there still are subtle ways in which society, the collective, enforces its authority over every one of us and it makes us act, speak, even think, even believe the way it wants us to. Another point is, conformity is not only a demand of the collective, but it is also an urge of the individual. There is the urge on the part of the individual, on, on almost on, on many of us to conform, to belong to a group, to be accepted as a member. So this uh, relationship between the society and the individual is, is interactive. The individual is not just a, a passive component of society. He or she participates in it. When this participation is uh, willing, voluntary, then uh, this relationship is complete. But uh, just like the tax that each citizen pays, whether he pays it uh, happily, willingly or out of you know fear of punishment, it still is important. In the same way, this acceptance of uh, the collective authority on the part of the individual is important for the smooth functioning of society. And in this process, I look at how the individual becomes a member of society, how he or she becomes socialized, and in this way, how the power is transferred from society to each of its members. This image that is visible on the screen. It is a, a real photo of a, a road seen from India. It's not photoshopped or anything. This is just show the chaotic scene. Authority, actually the role of authority, what it does is it organizes human energies into a productive power. This movie clip that we just watched of the the scene from the kindergarten cop shows how much energy there is in these in this group of young children. There, nobody is sitting there quietly, at least in this classroom, everybody is doing something very actively, very energetically, either screaming or painting or throwing something, at least making a mess. But all of that does require a lot of energy to make a lot of noise. There is a lot of energy, but actually none of this is uh, being productive. And for this, that authority is required to take all this human energy, to organize it, channelize it, condition it to an extent, and to create, convert it into a productive power. Untrained, unorganized energies don't accomplish. They need to be trained. And authority plays a role in training this, in conditioning this. Society does need the authority over its members to even just survive. Imagine a free society, free like you, you've never seen before, where anybody can do anything. For example, if, if the, what would we do without basic law enforcement, if all the police stations, the policemen, the courts, the prisons, all of these cease to exist, there would be total chaos, there would be absolutely no safety for anybody, for us, for our property, and uh, if we all did not have to strictly obey traffic rules, we would every day have scenes like this on our streets. 
who would go where how far on which side of the road do you go who stops when at the junctions what do we all do when do where do the pedestrians cross and when who lets the other overtake all of these we did not have strict rules we would not be able to exist there would be absolutely no safety for anybody so we need rules to enforce a basic discipline in society and without these rules without this this authority that society exercises over its members society would become dysfunctional we have uh, a lot of such rules that actually define us you no know, standard setting organizations like iso that ensure quality reliability we have copyright laws patent laws that uh, ensure ownership and check piracy uh, we have rules for you know hunting fishing for uh, you know checks on pollution on exploiting natural resources all these are necessary because without these as it is so many species are becoming extinct without these strict rules things would uh, get even worse and if countries did not have borders and visa regulations and laws and uh, a common currency or exchange rates we would not be able to function at all we would not have freedom we would have total chaos and anarchy so society cannot exist without some authority over its members and the power of society is derived from the willingness of its members to conform to accept its authority whether the willingness is brought about by by compulsion or fear or by identification a sense of belonging or patriotism or idealism society compulses all to adhere to a minimum standard and as society develops as it evolves it raises the standard that is required of its members there are different ways in which society imposes has imposed authority on us there is this japis proverb that the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down it's only if it sticks up that the tendency is there to hammer it down there are different ways in which society has done it there has been you know physical uh, first when we look at the second column the negative authority the negative ways in which society has imposed this authority there is been physical punishment like socrates he was a social moral critic and he was found guilty of you know corrupting the minds of uh, the young people and so he was forced to drink poison so physically punishing people exiling them sending them out of the community of the of the kingdom so this uh, physical force was used and then there have been you know, subtler ways as as we have evolved as society has evolved physical ways have been replaced by by more subtle maybe social mental ways uh, copernicus was scared to publish his idea about uh, ideas about the heliocentric theory till he was very very old uh, finally when he was on his death bed he said okay the book can be published when he he was past care and past any the fear of man he said the book can be published there was no physical uh, threat involved but still this uh, fear of uh, ostracism this was there which which forced people to act in certain ways and uh, modern societies they use even more subtle methods there are uh, when for example in physics the prominence of uh, the uh, string theory occupies in in in, in mainstream physics has forced uh, anybody who suggests an alternative uh, it it is forced them to actually conform with this mainstream it's difficult to get a job or to or to get funding for research or to get your research uh, published if if anybody does not you know conform with what is accepted in the mainstream so the uh, the, the tyranny of the majority or the powerful it's common everywhere not just in politics but even in academics as well so there is this is uh, the positive side of this authority the way society uh, imposes authority on everybody is there is a minimum standard of self discipline of personal conduct that is necessary from the part of the individual to 
So, so he or she can be made a part of society. And the other third column here, here the, uh, he, under the heading positive authority, this actually shows the ways in which society acts quite positively, but still it imposes it, it, its authority. When uh, a person confirms he or she is uh, included as part of the group, is offered protection, that person is uh, accepted, awarded prestige and recognition and respect. We, we see this in many stereotypes that are there. In um, 19th century in England and in most parts of Europe, women had, uh, in order to be considered a lady, they had to have a thorough knowledge of music, of the arts, of um, they had to learn one or two foreign languages and uh, they had to speak in a certain way. She had to have a certain air about her so she could be considered a lady. And there were many people who actually tried to live up to that standard. Today, even today actually, uh, we, we see such stereotypes exist in India, for example. And it uh, it, it, it is in other cultures as well. There are poems, there are songs that are sung in praise of women, comparing them to a candle. The candle burns, it, it burns itself and illuminates uh, the space around. And so when this kind of uh, mindset is praised, it, it sort of in a positive way, but it still forces women to adhere to that standard. So even through praise, even through recognition, sometimes this uh, people can be forced to conform. Um, Sometimes prestige is given to certain areas like somebody who studies uh, medicine or computer science or law. So, so, some, some of these courses, they are appreciated. Anybody who gets into medical college is, is considered really great. Certain subjects are, are very prestigious and this very, very uh, subtly discourages pursuit of other uh, subjects like uh, history or, or, or literature. Uh, students, youngsters are silently discouraged from studying these subjects because of this uh, prestige that is accorded to science and to computer science and to medicine. So, society also imposes its authority through this kind of uh, appreciation. We all know this uh, the story of uh, the emperor's new clothes. This is a picture from uh, de depicting a scene, one, one, the, the final scene from that story. This, these two tailors who just proves they promise the king that they can uh, uh, make a dress for him, and uh, this dress is so special that it can only be seen by people who are intelligent, wise, and fit for their positions. Actually, they are just proofs and they do nothing at all. They they give him. Uh, they pretend to make clothes, they pretend to give him the garment and they say, oh, isn't this beautiful? And the king says, oh, yes, of course, I've never seen anything like this before. It's excellent. He's too scared to say, I see nothing. And it's not just him, all the people, he goes out in this procession thinking he's wearing these magical clothes. He's wearing nothing at all. And all the people, they go, oh, this is beautiful. They all outdo each other in, in praise of this, uh, this, this dress that they don't see. And so actually, um, nobody asks everybody to pretend. Nobody even tells the king, now you're supposed to see it. He says, oh yes, I see it, before anybody can ask anything. And the people are not required to be able to see. Nobody says, uh, if you don't see, you get this punishment. But still, everybody has this you know, urge to say, oh, this is beautiful, this is excellent. There's this urge in everybody to conform, to say, yes, I see this dress and it is excellent. They all are so eager to actually belong to this group. And uh, the word authority, conformity, all of these are not totally positive terms today. They all bring to mind an image of a large uh, moving assembly line where in the place of machines or cars are people who are being uh, assembled and fitted to a uniform standard. But uh, this... The scene from the kindergarten classroom or the thought of, you know, driving in a street where there is absolutely no road rule, it, it brings home the truth in, in a saying of Charles Vaughan, an American journalist. He said, we are half ruined by conformity, but uh, we should be wholly ruined without it. 
So, conformity we all see, too much of it does actually curtail growth, but in the absence of any con conformity, in the total absence of conformity, we would all be wholly ruined. Social conformity, it ensures the survival and the growth of its uh, members. We, we all uh, feel there's no safety in numbers, even physically, traveling in a new place, being in a deserted area. It's much easier to sing in chorus than to do a solo performance. So this urge to belong to a group was there. We, we all love to follow. It's not a very inspiring image of ourselves, but actually if we you know, look at ourselves closely, we, we see this tendency in the trends that are set by famous people, sports stars, singers, actors. There is a Latin proverb that uh, fashion is more powerful than any tyrant. What does a tyrant do? He has to say, take so much effort to enforce conformity. He has to keep an eye on everybody all the time to see who is uh, stepping into out of line. But uh, I, I, I mentioned yesterday that when uh, England's uh, Princess Kate, she steps out of her car, within minutes dresses similar to what she's wearing are sold out from online stores. She does not say, all of you are supposed to wear clothes like me, but people are just eager to do what she is doing. Even when stocks are low, people are willing to even pay five times the actual cost of the dress in order to buy something and wear something that Princess Kate is wearing. And so, the power and the pre pressure to conform is so great. Even when there is no threat, no physical threat, none at all, we, we many of us can almost always do it. fashion and trends and uh, it's said that uh, many people love to buy an iPod or a, 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 one of these, you know, products, an I, iPad or, or an iPhone, the day it is launched. There are stories of, you know, people traveling from uh, South America to New York just to be able to buy, buy an iPhone on the first day that it is launched. And there was a report that... Uh, during a typhoon in Japan, people stayed in line in front of an Apple store to be able to buy it on the first day. So all of this actually is uh, a way in which we conform to society. Now this picture is here as a contrast to the image that I showed in the beginning where there was a chaotic, um, chaotic traffic on the road at a junction. Authority becomes necessary when our own values are substandard. Conformity is the lower part of self-discipline. Sometimes an external compulsion or an external appreciation. It is required to force us, to make us do what is beneficial to us. Sometimes when we ourselves are unwilling to do it, for example, you know, making a um, seat belts compulsory, making it mandatory to wear safety gear or, or banning the use of cell phones while driving and um, making insurance mandatory during overseas travel or uh, many such rules are there, rules and safety procedures that force people to comply. It helps everybody. For example, if we take... Um, air travel. We know that we, there are so many rules and sometimes we even find these rules very inconvenient. Come to the uh, uh, airport oh, an hour or an hour and a half before the departure. You should have only this many bags and the bag should not be, should not weigh more than this much. All of these products are not allowed um, or substances are not allowed uh, in the baggage or you should not carry any liquid. All of these, sometimes we do find it inconvenient but actually it is only all of these rules that make tra travel safety for us, for everybody. If it were not for this, air, air travel without all these strict rules would not be safe. Maybe it would not even be possible. It is not only when our own values are substandard that... Uh, Conformity comes to our rescue. We actually cannot live in a society without rules. We need them for our survival, for our safety, for the safety of other people. If it were not for all these strict rules, like like even uh, 
road rules we would uh, be unable to even step out of the house actually and so conforming to society accepting all of these rules internalizing them to different extents like whether we do it unwillingly or or, or uh, with complaints or whether we do it idealistically or whether we internalize it freely and make uh, make them our own uh, values all of these make us part of society make us part of the whole and we know that once we become part of the whole we get access to all of these powers that society has all of these institutions that are there they become ours when we become part of them and this actually we are able to tap into all these powers that society has available like like a bank robber if you take he's outside of society he doesn't belong to society he cannot participate in society he cannot uh, even use his own name whereas today we have all the educational institutions research institutions uh, serving us providing us with knowledge we have the banks the all the other uh, financial institutions that serve us the government and the police and the army all of these when we become a part of society all this becomes available to us all of this power that we can tap into this is possible because we actually belong we become part of society now this is um, something like a prequel to what and we just heard from alberto and this is where i i i sort of catch up conformists they they lend stability to society and society in turn ensures their survival there is a saying that uh, society honors its living conformists and its dead troublemakers why is that so there are limits to this uh, growth that is made possible by conformists by their conformity it's like in a classroom the teacher caters to the average of the students that is what the society does it caters to the average of its members everybody is ensured of some amount of growth but there are some people who rise at the top they are not dependent on society they don't want their pace to be set by society in a class if we take the teacher uh, teaches or, or goes up uh, to the pace of the average student but then there are some students who are above average and these people their progress is curtailed they are not allowed to go at their pace in some in in some countries in some cultures in schools where the, there is a lot less uh, no, freedom given or individuality allowed everybody has to study this one lesson that is all and when a child is so bright that he or she has uh, completed it in half the time the other half of the time the period is allowed to go waste that potential is wasted in the same way uh, society does the same thing to these people who are we could say above average these well developed strong individuals they don't depend on society to lead them they are not uh, they don't have to belong they can lead society instead they don't need uh, to receive power from society but they are so powerful that they can change the rules and uh, so sometimes conformity beyond the point when it is too rigid in some situations it can go wrong it can stifle growth this is very true when the collective direction is very very clearly wrong like for example when the whole world or many of the powerful countries they are uh, stocking up on nuclear weapons it uh, creates this feeling of, among the other countries that they should also keep pace they should also join the race for example in india when uh, uh, india developed nuclear capacity every a, a lot of people at least were very jubilant like oh we've also arrived now even we are there sometimes when the general direction is clearly wrong sometimes this just force everybody in the wrong direction like you know group thing so here what i would uh, like to emphasize is conformity and the social ritual they have their place much like the fire drill the table manners or the traffic rules that we all have to comply with but we are products of society but not exclusively social products social conformity may be an urge but we also have the urge to express our freedom and so 
conformity does not uh, give the complete picture of uh, social and individual development. The individual is not only uh, changed by the world, he or she also has the capacity, the power to change the world. And uh, these you know, fully developed, strong individuals, they can lead society. They are like the little boy in uh, the emperor's new clothes. When all the people are trying to outdo each other and praising the emperor and his uh, clothes that don't exist, there is a little boy who is not conditioned by society, who does not have this uh, urge to conform as yet. He says, but the emperor is wearing nothing at all. He is the one who can see the truth. He is the one who uh, tells everybody the actual truth. And so these individuals are like that little boy. They are not conditioned by society and they have the power to lead society. And uh, their story begins uh, with stepping out of conformity and these and uh, we will, I'm sure, be hearing more of uh, individuality in, in, in further lectures. And I'd like to conclude with just this point that uh, authority, conformity, up to a point, up to a stage, they do have a place in society. They make society functional to an extent. Beyond the point when carried uh, too far, they end up uh, stifling growth. Thank you. Thank you. some problems with the notion of conformity, mainly because it presupposes some satellite. You have to have a clear picture of how human personality interfaces with uh, expectations of identity, expectations of acting and demanding access to the important things in such a way, and expectations of expectation of cultural expectation, stability. So that it seems to me that at the level anterior to the notion of conformity, we, we deal with the utter complexity of human personality systems with the, the capacity for uh, restricted or extended identifications. Uh, uh, and, and when it comes to the fundamental values of social coexistence, if they don't demand anything, well, they're going to be in the worst possible shape. Uh, if they demand, they, will, they, they may well be demanding a, a change in conformity, if you like, because they're not getting enough. Enough people in society are not experiencing enough of the, of the, the material of the needs of And then uh, I think the better concept probably is is expectations, that is to say. Uh, people don't only expect society to be in perpetual change, they also expect some uh, institutions of human coexistence to be somewhat stable. Uh, maybe that's what we mean by conformity, I'm not sure. But I would say that from a, an interdisciplinary point of view, uh, and, and I think she's conceded that to an end, but there are some people who make change in the end. Uh, but I think if you accept the uh, assumptions that many fellows accept, main, mainly the, the, the starting point of social inquiry and their political inquiry is human capital. And when you unpack human capital, then you look at the, the capital of identity, the capital of, of, a, of, an, act, of an active claiming agent, no democracy, is worth a damn if no one ever claims anything. And, and, and then the defense of those things that are worthwhile and the jettisoning of those institutions that are not. And that still remains the, the big challenge today. So I, I would probably frame it a little bit differently, but that's a, a short comment. On this. I hear this presentation in the context of what Janani spoke yesterday and what we were talking about uh -huh. today. So the context, I agree with everything you said, but I don't see it as a contradiction. I think it's a question of what level we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about, social science is the science of how human beings accomplish 
to realize different goals or different values. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, yesterday she was making the case that by being part of society, we acquire an enormous power mm -hmm. just by membership in the society. Mm -hmm. uh, we get, we inherit, but human experience is a bit more complex than that because you can be a part of a society, but the fundamentals of that society are essentially meant a huge quanta of those people. I'm not going to get it. That's the society that she and I grew up in, apartheid. Or you want to take Stalin's Russia, you know? We're, uh, you take it as a, if we, uh, it's true that everything has an extreme from one end to the other, but I think there's a fundamental that it's not contradicted even, mm -hmm. even there. If we want to talk in this room, mm -hmm. if we want to, we need to follow a certain, there needs to, there's a certain consensus mm -hmm. that we will listen to one speaker at a time. Sure. That we will start at a particular time, or uh, the speaker will honor us by speaking up for too long so that we have time yes. for questions. That's conformity. Mm -hmm. It's not the way we, the word we would use for it necessarily. If we want to communicate over the internet, mm -hmm. we have a choice. Either we speak in the language called HTML, mm -hmm. or we don't participate. We may say internet empowers me, but it empowers me as long as I speak the language of HTML. The computer and no other computer will honor or recognize anything else. So I think in looking at a transdisciplinary science, we're first asking the question, how does society accomplish? <laughs> Alberto was stressing the point that our power comes from our relationships with one another. Not in everything do we assert our individuality. In many things we do cooperatively. We live, so the, I thought the traffic rules is a good example. We are all conformists on the traffic, on that road, and nobody is accused of subordinating their individuality by driving on the right side of the street and stopping at a red light. But it is a conformity. Whether that's imposed because there's a policeman on the corner, or because we feel it's right to obey the rules even when there's nobody there on the street uh, is, a, is a difference from individual to individual. But I thought, imagine the society doing what we do now without that. Now if the society is tyrannical, that conformity enables the society to maintain that power. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, in a free society, we freely conform to a certain level. One, because I want your acceptance. Two, because if I don't play by the rules, I can't get on the web. Mm -hmm. Three, because I can benefit to a certain extent by that conformity, and beyond a certain level, it inhibits and limits my individuality, which I think is all she was saying. I thought the important point for me in this is that if we want a science of society, basically we have to understand how human beings accomplish things. We are hopefully taking the positive examples of not how we tyrannize each other, but it's true, the same process that we use to empower uh, students, which Alberto was talking about, uh, you flip around uh, the variables and the same, you reverse the direction, and the same process can be used to tyrannize, indoctrinate, uh, and, uh, you know, instill uh, religious terror or, uh, or political... Uh, uh, so, I think, it, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I think it doesn't undermine the fact that when you go out on the road, you also, that when you're in Croatia, you also pay the Croatian currency, and, uh, and when you're on the plane, uh, we don't make much of a fuss uh, uh, if uh, uh, we don't insist, no, I am going to take this knife or this gun on the plane because we know we'll end up in, you know, in jail. There are rules that we voluntarily accept. Some for our prestige, some just because we benefit so much by accepting those rules. Just the term conformity. Yeah, it's, yes. 
It seems to be a bit strong for me. It hasn't been out of taste in the mouth. Yeah. She said, I have a lot of taste. I think that's what's so interesting about it, because though it has a bad social construction, we're doing it all the time. We came here with clothes on today. Somebody else. Yeah. No, my, I guess I have, this is a great introduction to my lecture tomorrow. I'll we'll be talking about the network of institutions and uh, anyway, I'm looking for a uh, recent lecture that might follow. Uh, but uh, uh, the interesting thing is the relations for me. This is what you see the relations between, as you, I agree with you, that the development of uh, society could be measured by raising the common standards, mm -hmm. rules, you know, the level. And the, 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 what is the relations now and how we evaluate society in terms of Conformity of these rules, are they confined because we embedded them, with the, because they are coming from our values, or because there is a strong enforcement mechanism? And this is something what is very important in terms of evaluation of the level of society. And this is the issue, who set the rules? And then how we respond to the confirming. And so this is something what is the issue with uh, We are talking about uh, development basic standards. It's great, it's I agree. And the issue is, I think, that the higher uh, level of society could be measured by Voluntary conformity. Mm -hmm. I confine with the rules because I identify myself. I don't need policemen. You've internalized the values exactly. because you see the exactly. benefits of doing so, it. So, because, you know, I mean, that, that based on the values. But it takes time. You know, what? Uh, an obvious example is credit card system. I think credit card business in the world today may be almost $10 trillion a year. Mm -hmm. Visa alone is about five, so I'm guessing the rest. Uh, all of us who use a credit card, we do it by accepting to conform that we're going to at least make the minimum payment every month on our card. Uh, and it works only because wherever you go in the world to a merchant, they don't ask what's your name or religion or nationality. They simply take your credit card and validate that there's system. the system approves the credit. Mm -hmm. In India, there have been, and many other countries, I'm sure, they've been trying very hard to extend credit to the lowest levels of the society, uh, like the farmers. And uh, typically, every few years, they have to write off the agricultural debts. Because when the farmers have taken the loan, they had no intention of paying it back. They said, oh, now I can uh, I take a loan for cultivation and I get my daughter married. <laughs> you know, and uh, no way to get no way to pay that loan back. Uh, so because they have not yet come to internalize the exactly. value exactly. of integrity, exactly. uh, this society says then you can't be part of this system. Yeah. We have to be more ingenious in creating a system <laughs> where you will, which you will uh, conform to. So see, uh, yeah. In the way she goes from conformity mm. to mm. the well developed strong individuals mm. dependent on, not dependent on slavery, they live instead. Mm. Uh, that's an interesting idea, uh, but it's, it, it is a very well developed idea in the literature of, uh, of political psychology. The uh, problem of power and society, the problem of the power seated personality, the power of the Totalitarian style personality, the power of the 
authoritative president. And, and the power in the mobs, but democratically, right? those are all uh, uh, sort of products of society, whether they conform or not conform. Uh, we, we can't predict why, out of a conservative family or a priestly family, we might get someone who's a real radical, a real revolution. You know? uh, those things do happen. But there's a, a, a more important story behind the, the, the study, and I think it's understudied of the, the emergence and sapience of, of personality types, the political agitator, the political revolution, and so on, in social dynamics. I mean, and, and, and why it is this whole class of people are also non conformists, you see, because they want to impose a different type of conformity on, on social matrix. This, I think, thanks to the people's comment to your presentation here today. There are all of those black people who move to the back of the bus, but why did Rosa Parks alone not do it? What is the process which uh, changes her? They stop uh, allowing the society to need them, and then there is that chain, there is that switch. Which one day, one lady says, I won't move. Mm -hmm. I think there's a valid... Oh, go ahead, somebody. Uh, what's this? Please introduce us. Oh, uh, this is uh, Elisa Kahn. She's a former judge and I, court of South Africa, and uh, president of the magistrates, and I don't know what, but she's doing. But anyway, she's over here with the I'm allowed to speak. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah. welcome, Elisa. Please spoke on the phone once. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. 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 That was a great speech. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make the point of the essential essence of Homo sapiens. And according to philosophical um, theories, human beings, Homo sapiens, are selfish people on the one hand. On the other hand, they are interdependent. They cannot survive mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is because of that paradox that we require rules of law. A rule of law is required in order to regulate that society or else selfish people would go out there and grab what they want and the others. So law conformity is required. I look at it very broadly, I don't know the background, I haven't heard anything else. Mm -hmm. But individuality, in my view, cannot exist without conformity and vice versa. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. since time immemorial, we go through cyclical areas. We think it's bad now, but when we go back, it's actually been better. We've passed the era where people are hanged on the mm -hmm. stomach mm -hmm. square, mm -hmm. and all children and families mm -hmm. go and cheer mm -hmm. and whatever. I think one's got to strike a very careful balance between that and I agree with you, it's got to be done on different levels. I think that when you look at society as a whole and conformity, mm -hmm. it would depend on the principles that they follow because global investment capital would want them to follow a certain principle. So when you speak about individuals mm -hmm. who are strong and good and could lead, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the kind of individuals we want that rule the world like now, which is mm -hmm. comprised of global investment capital, because all they think of is themselves. Mm -hmm. If we had Gandhi, if we had another Teresa, mm -hmm. by all means it would be a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to raise that issue with you, that one needs to, I think, possibly go into it, analyze it a lot more, and then look at leadership and qualify it. Oh. Uh, I'm not prescribing to you, I think you had a good, it was a brilliant speech, uh, I think it was a brilliant speech, that, that, that if we were to say leaders, if you say leaders, and, and you speak openly about leaders, who are leaders? Leaders are people who are, what comes to mind, to the average Joe Blocks, people in government, and right now, those are the people who feel that their interests are not the interests of the majority of the world's population. 
and that is why 95% or 90% of the world's wealth is monopolized mm -hmm. by those investment capital corporations. Corporations now are more powerful than politicians. So I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes. I'm Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Carlos, you have a comment? Yes. My God, you are making me think. What an amount of energy. The brain brain consumes a lot of energy. So, no, regarding uh, Tommy Service, uh, of course, it's an honor to, to be here and to, and to have to think and thank you for this presentation. Regarding conformity and and what I would call the emergence of social norms. The first comment, which looks like a provocation, but it's not, uh, is that the people who know more about this are the people who work in the fashion industry. <laughs> yes, because if we talk about conformity, let's look at a practical day-to-day -day phenomenon. Yeah. For instance, uh, how, fashion, how fashion trends are created, that's not the problem, because when you talk with uh, people in the fashion industry, with the creators in the fashion or in the TV or in the movie industry, they always say to you, we have no idea if a film or a trend, a fashion trend, etc., will succeed or not before it comes out. We still don't know. We still how it, uh, how the diffusion works, if it works. But we still don't know if it will work. If the norm, uh, whether it's scope, uh, it depends. Of course, the norm may, may be something the fashion trends, which only lasts uh, for a season and uh, among a certain group of people. But so they still don't know exactly if the norm will emerge or. But uh, but uh, much more is known, I think, about how it emerges and. As a matter of fact, besides the fashion people, the TV and movies, uh, people uh, whose business depends on, on the creation of new social norms, there is a good uh, bunch of literature about, uh, about this, about the creation of social norms, especially in the community I talked about yesterday, in the community of uh, who analyzes complex systems, and this has much to do with networks, as probably as many will illuminates us to, tomorrow. And uh, so uh, the people who look at that reach uh, very, some quite clear conclusions which were, uh, as usual, known for a long time away, but we have to rediscover them all the time as with many, many knowledge in, in social affairs. We have to rediscover something which uh, bright mind thought uh, some centuries ago. And uh, the, what they discovered is that the mechanism, the mechanism of social interaction around this creation of social norms are very basic. Basically, it is either imitation or innovation or variation. So, imitation of what you see around you or variation on, on that. As, as an individual, you basically work with that and the fact that you uh, rely very much on the people with you, which you trust most or which uh, reputation you appreciate most. So, so the, the way the norm expands is typically through connectors who are people who are very well connected and very well recognized, and this is especially true in the fashion, in the extension of fashion trends, some people those uh, Malcolm Gladwell talked about in the tipping point, are able to influence the type of shoes that a lot of many people are, are going to wear. So they, they, they play somehow, they play that role. So it's imitation plus variation. The funny thing about this is that uh, uh, French thinker Gabriel Tab, who is a sociologist, wrote about this uh, I would say, one century and a half ago. So he proposed, out of almost nothing, you know, he invented the concept out of almost nothing. He was also a criminologist. So he was interested in analyzing how trends and 
social phenomena happened. He had a very original ideas, and he wasn't heard at his time, and not much uh, after that. But he, he proposed, so he, he foresaw that the mechanism was no, that the social norms extend through, uh, let's say, close contacts. So it's in the vicinity where you, you build up your norms based on limitation and, and sometimes variations. Well, I think it's a little bit point to make it to this. Um, and that is what then is the interrelationship between social norms in the sense that you describe it with uh, the, the fashion and so on, and, uh, uh, and compulsive psychological behavior fed by gratification. Mm -hmm. and, and that some people say is the uh, of of consumerism, so that that itself is a a creation, but it's a creation in which, if you think norms are mediated, uh, the norms of consumerism are driven rather than mediated. I think, and they are driven by compulsive behavior. Some people say instant gratification, and so on. maybe Alberto could say something. Yeah, the point is that, I, I agree, the point is that uh, this phenomena may be mediated, but they build on something, mm -hmm. on, on, on something deep, I mean, I mean particularly the, the need for recognition mm -hmm. by, by others, mm -hmm. if we go which may be a variant of the need for love, but, uh, but anyway, the need for social recognition. So, of course, mm -hmm. consumerism is an extremely... Uh, but I think way of uh, trying well, to very that. shallow when you're looking at the deeper question of uh, the psychosocial uh, need for an authentic love, if you like. That's yeah. If we go back to what Alberto was talking about this morning about empowerment, mm -hmm. I, I don't like the word conformity at all. I mean, come on, <laughs> you're <laughs> that generation, you know. Yeah, right. That's why I kind of like there's a math thing. Masochistic, I, I like to I know there's, there's some truth in what you say. Don't call it, don't call it over and give it some other term, call it what it is. But maybe the answer comes, if I think back to what Alberto said this morning, all the examples I've given of the practical utility of conformity, whether it's for the credit card or the HTML or the traffic, are all conformity that empowers. It empowers me to follow this conformity. It's not a conformity that deprives me of my identity and my soul. <laughs> because I play by the rules of credit card, I get access to the, to the wonderful facilities. Because I play by HTML, I conform to HTML, I get access to the world uh, electronically. If you're a company, because you follow the international standards for uh, financial, for preparing your financials, you get access to the global capital market, which you don't get if you decide on each preparing your financial statements uh, the way you want. So maybe, yeah, I'm glad if you're going to talk, yeah, and just, but maybe uh, there's something there that links this to the empowerment issue. There is conformity that disempowers us. Mm -hmm. yes. Whether we do it voluntarily, which we do a lot, if I feel I've got to dress in a particular way and spend an inordinate amount of my limited income just it to... It would be the big subject. Or yeah. it's a conformity that empowers, and maybe there's a link between these two which I haven't seen. Very shortly, uh, it's interesting that the word that conformity is uh, coming from the Latin, which says that with shape. It is uh, being, uh, shaping uh, and uh, conform, is that? Yeah. And uh, uh, that, that there are, a, a, you know, a big spectrum, and I agree with that, but even before, uh, I would say that uh, a way of shaping the uh, reality, since uh, we are meme-making uh, man-making, uh, is language. And the language uh, gives a very interesting uh, example because, uh, uh, you know, I remember when I was uh, in uh, uh, elementary school in Italian, you know, they would teach me 
uh, you know, what is the proper use of language? Uh, and since uh, I was always like, a problematic student, but then I was protesting uh, that, that they were teaching us uh, that what they were teaching us uh, wasn't true. Because we had to study by road, uh, not very sexy, uh, poetry, you know, some Italian poetry, Dante Alighieri, by road. But uh, it was very clear that the rules of the grammar were not to respect of the poet, but the poet that were, you know, the, given an example. So I remember, I protested to the injustice of the, this uh, meaning making. Uh, the point is, uh, very shortly, that uh, in a conformity, there are very degree. One is definitely, I prefer, to make it implicit, explicit, so it's in power now. But uh, I agree with uh, my friend Winston that, that, that social psychology and political psychology, Laszlo, one of your mentors, but also Will Hambright, with that wonderful right. book, uh, Mass Psychology of Fascism, uh, Will Hambright can show that actually he was kicked out by the mm. German Communist Party for saying that, but <laughs> did the research that actually fascism is not an ideology. You can be fascist and be a Marxist Leninist, and you can be a fascist and right, but the fascists have a, a common character structure, yeah. and I agree with that, that they are threatened by every expression of freedom of expression. You know, so they would repress uh, the vitality and the uh, creativity of pupils, uh, and they would uh, uh, repress uh, the freedom of expression uh, of personal thinking uh, and personal decoding, uh, and so that's why they are also, you know, shaping everything uh, square and heavy, even in architecture, and uh, there are so many interesting, even uh, Adorno, uh, you know, yeah. That, uh, uh, we need the conformity, but how much a conformity yeah. we need? Uh, yeah. 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 Yes, great. Yes, we share with uh, Winston uh, why we uh, do not like the term market to go on in the system where the rules are not to empower us. <laughs> 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 the generation of the 60s which really challenged the, the, the rules and I think that the, 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 the last question uh, Alberto raised you know, the proportion in conformity and, uh, and the revolution and the challenge and this is why we are mainly people from academia so we don't feel comfortable from that point of view because we are challenged the truth who are trying to respond to the new uh, phenomenon going on, global warming, you know, wars, poverty, and so on, we are looking for the new ways to respond, which are beyond the current rules, tools, <laughs> and norms which we are uh, looking for. So this is something quite uh, the issue is the, the, the proportion. But isn't this thing conformity is a, is a kind of uh, rather comfortable uh, psychology of being? You know? Yeah. And, and that troubles me. Yeah. Because, you know, you can get comfortable with yeah. all the other yeah. things yeah. in your life, whatever. You know? So I, I'm, that's something that is an educator. Just well, I think it can really to trouble us. I think our purpose is to understand its role. Mm -hmm. And if there is a fund, obviously, if you've got a military which you want to defend you, you want the soldiers to conform to the, the rules. To the rules. Right? Right. You know, that's comforting and secure yeah. for us. Yeah. So I think we need to clap. We need to be able to see the whole spectrum and see yeah. where it's a power and where it's essential and where it's uh, it's negative. That's all. We're looking for that fundamentals. There's a question online. I'll just take one, he's been waiting online for a while. Okay. Ashok, you had a question? Uh, Jeremy? Um, yes. I find uh, 
every generation committing the same mistake uh, that the previous generation did as if uh, they learned nothing uh, mm -hmm. what is that uh, i see many children they they see their parents have led a very unhappy married life mm -hmm. but that doesn't prevent them from entering into marriage of their own <laughs> they believe some of their marriage will be different mm -hmm. and sadly that proves to be wrong what happened in their parents life gets repeated in their children's life mm -hmm. so what is this phenomena of every generation repeating the mistakes of the previous generation as if nothing has changed is would you call that some kind of conformism mm -hmm. did everybody follow the question no no you want to we don't often learn from others mistakes in the example that he gave us when you see your parents marriage was unhappy the children still go ahead get married and even if the same thing repeats in their own life in their own marriage they don't seem to have learned from the mistake their parents made so every generation repeats the same thing so could that be called conformity anybody want to come <laughs> um i just think that we all come from different cultures and countries we want to really go go into the uh geographical demographics of each country because the cultures are so different in south in south africa where we have suffered years and years and years of oppression and introduce a constitution which according to my opinion the exiles who had been studying at first world universities were prevented from coming into south africa to see the lay of the land to see the poverty stricken society to see the fact that people were not civilized were not educated had been fighting a physical revolution took the base of the base of the G8 countries and came up with a base constitution which is now nothing but paper and cannot translate into reality because there's no resources to do so i say it was a bunch of romantic academics who were not realistic came to south africa thinking that they were in their land of exile and expected to see very civilized society So, in our country, we now, as opposed, to, I'm not sure. I mean, India, we have had a lot of, we also have a lot of um, gender and child um, violence. But in South Africa, we reach a stage where now our parliament is so focused on it, so that women now seem to have more power than men. But is it a real power? to question we ask okay is it a power that is there to make society believe that women are powerful here something that is that and so people need to take us and they say oh our well, women are so empowered okay the behind all of that is the old mm. and i think we we are in from india yeah you have a more serious problem of a serious problem and so when we sit here as the key people from the key countries i think we look at it from our own perspectives in our own countries okay and i think once we analyze each country and then realize our own see where the problem lies i mean that is especially just in violence against gender and children that is my special special uh it 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 interest And, and 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 you look at the rest of Africa. Look what's happened to the woman. I mean, if you go along the 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 the, the, the um, what's the place? Most of Africa, the women are doing the work. The men are sitting back and doing nothing. You know, there is no education of the woman, and the men are so much in control that without the woman, there wouldn't be a society. So it's very complex. I think once we go into the individual countries and analyze it more. <laughs>
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to divide a bit the discussion that actually I wanted to... I, I like the fact that you started with the distinction that I think it went a bit maybe unnoticed because we discussed it about birth. In the beginning, you start by the degree of authority that is needed in society. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it's an important distinction between authority and the conformance that authority uh, engenders, and on the other hand, just conformance. There are two different things. And actually, um, there's an author that I like quite a lot, his name is Project. Yes, it's like very simple theory that I'm going to oversimplify here for the sake of uh, He says that the problem of authority is a problem related to time, to the problem of time. Basically what he does, he divides the right three time instances, past, present, and future. And then from these three time instances, we can divide, we can derive four types of authority. An authority that is based on the past, and this would be the authority of a priest, of a king, of whatever, an authority that relies on tradition, if you want. An authority that is built of, based upon the vision upon the future, and this would be the authority of a chief, of a leader, of, okay? And then an authority based on the present, and that would be mainly the authority of a judge, the, a person that is able, with the knowledge required to take a decision within the present, and the that is accepted by a man. Okay, there is like the fourth type of authority of a person that has authority derived from the, his um, ability of um, seeing all the three time instances together, and this is the authority of God. But that is a whole new discussion. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, I'm thinking that authority can actually be the root of an exiting from a conformity. Going back to the story with Rosa, basically what Rosa did when she refused to get out of that chair, was basically to change the future. It shows like she had a vision of this is going to be the future. This past, this, this present is no longer tolerable. Mm -hmm. And when people boycott it the second day, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the outcomes, they recognize her authority, they recognize her as a leader. We always think the leader is going to be like, this guy is like, no, 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 mm -hmm. the leader it was Rose at that moment, mm -hmm. and then it was Luther before they became like important historical figures. There are people that were exactly some sort of authority on the very close. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that would be, and I think you started with that, and I think that yeah. maybe going in, in that direction would be interesting. Urge. Urge. Thank you. This makes, raises one thought for me, you know, in the academy we're grappling with all the normal challenges, just to, <laughs> to be sure we have enough to keep our minds busy. Uh, we call it the, new, the need for a new paradigm. To what extent is the existing paradigm reinforced and sustained by the conformity of society to the way things are today? And how would we move to another behavior of conformity? Uh, I mean, for today, we have discussed in many of our conferences about the need to control financial speculation, which is really destabilizing the global economy. It's not supporting it, the prosperity of the nations. And yet, if you talk to people who don't have money in the financial markets, uh, whose jobs are at risk because of that, uh, still there's a certain conformity in, well, this is part of, this is what we should want, this is good, isn't it? So, uh, if we want to create solutions to, so we've got nuclear weapons, I think most of the polls of Americans show, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the opinion polls show that 70 to 80 percent of the American population thinks we shouldn't have these, that it's better that all these weapons are uh, abolished. But we still got them. Uh, uh, what would we need in terms of new patterns of social conformity to solve the problems we have? It's another way of looking at this. I don't know the answer, but it's uh, provocative. Maybe, you know, maybe we start and I thought you raised really interesting points. When you think of conformity and your client, what I've been focusing on, mm. it was conformity, and that would not have been answered. The problem would not have arised. Ferguson, in America, everybody knows what yeah. they like. And after Ferguson, suddenly, every other state had brought out a big tool African black males yeah. had been biased against, vicious against, and nobody took notice. Now, 
we speak about different conformity in different contexts. They went out there, they got a further invitation, they got a visit to the government, the government came out, the whole world came out, it went on for days and days and days. So when you look at that, then within that context, conformity actually was not the answer. You know what I'm saying? Because by not conforming to the usual going to prison, to prison for the night and then being released, it had, you know, outraged the international community and was placed on pages and then out came an outpouring of the frustration of black males who were really literally put into a little car walk and lost. So, I don't know how that helps, but I thought it was fascinating to see that evolve. I think the area of problem with the nuclear weapons, and particularly, that is a, a, a complex problem because you could say, well, since a vast majority of the, the people, I mean, like the big authority country of people, don't want nuclear weapons, so why does it still persist? But now you also have a, 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 an authority structure based on the Constitution that essentially empowers a minority. Mm -hmm. a, and the minority is absolutely determined to keep nuclear weapons, and if they're getting the opportunity to even develop new generations of them, and, and so you then have to grapple with whether and if so how you can change the authority structure. Uh, but there is no, to my knowledge, even with granite and all this, people, a real strategy that looks at the specific um, institutions of authority that have the, the most power over the problem, you know. Uh, and so we don't have that. We don't, most of the people in the the very extensive um, network of uh, interest groups, of course, in nuclear weapons, uh, really refrain from the specific political strategy that at least I think has to have. Namely, we have to start up the, the Senate Armed Services Committee and you have to identify who the specific people are there, the six or seven people, that will block any action on this no matter what. <laughs> they are the people that have to be targeted for political action. You might even have them to look at what their electoral status is and whether you can uh, approach the electoral college that elects them. Yes. But those are the practical things. They will not do anything so long as they can get away with it. So, so, but it's a slightly different problem, and it is it, it rests with the with the Constitution itself limiting the authority of the American people over the specific, over questions like this. Sorry. That's a very similar problem with the corporate uh, countries. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're right on schedule again.